for me, it's always been about focusing on how can we use technology to transform the way we develop, grow, and care for our employees. Don't conduct your analysis in isolation because data is so incredibly powerful. Not defending just the tribe, but defending the organization. Those creative people that you really want to keep empowered, keep excited, keep motivated, keep thinking. A good experience pays dividends down the line. Stereotypes tend to break down in proximity. Welcome to We're Only Human, a podcast about human resources, business, technology, and the workplace. My name is Ben Eubanks, your host, and I'm so glad you're here. Hey everyone, welcome to We're Only Human. I'm Ben Eubanks, your host. So glad to have you back here. Today, I'm really excited. I've uh, had had the pleasure of making a new friend during all the, the quarantine craziness in the world, and um, I, I've come to rely on him as a resource, as an expert, as a, goodness, the sounding board, everything and all in between. Um, Christopher Lenz, he's the head of global digital learning at GE Healthcare. He's the host of the very popular learning tech talk, so I'm sure we'll, we'll dig into that in a little bit, um, as well as the founder of Learning Sharks. So he's got a lot of hats that he wears, and he's a, also a dad of many children, just like me. So Christopher, welcome, sir. Hey, thanks, Ben, and uh, always always fun to chat, so it's nice we're actually recording it and uh, sh- sharing it out. I know, we have so many good talks, and I'm like, man, that would have been really great to share with the, the, the bigger <laughs> world. Only we had been recording at the time. Yeah, I know, so now we're finally doing it. <laughs> So I gave them a, some some insight into the the titles that you're that you have the again the hats you're wearing. But tell us more about who you are and what you do. Yeah. So the you know who who are you? That's a, that's a big question. So I'll try and you you actually covered it pretty well, right? In terms of the titles and yeah, I have lots of kids type thing. But I guess at the core of it, I think my biggest thing when I look at you know when people say what what are you or what do you do. For me, it's always been about focusing on how can we use technology to transform the way we develop, grow, and and honestly care for our employees, right? How do we actually make people better and use technology to optimize that? So regardless of what job I've had in my career, you'll always see that threaded throughout. And, And that's really where Learning Sharks came to be. It's why I ended up at GE. It's what Learning Tech Talks is all about. Um, because I recognize having grown up in this space it's scary and overwhelming for people. And I guess I've always been uh, a helper, I guess would be the word. It's why I got into teaching. Um, and you know, it's why when I discovered that what I really wanted to be when I grew up was to coach and help other people. That, that's what I wanted to do. I love this stuff, but I got more satisfaction out of other people understanding and seeing it than I did myself. So that, that's the professional side. And then yes, with five little ones, nine and under, I don't really have time for much other than just hanging out with them and, and then all the other things at work. So that is, that is my life, which we often talk about and joke about. Yes, absolutely. You know, it's funny to hear you say that the reason like you started out doing and now you, but you're drawn to the teaching and the coaching others. And I've never put it in those words, but I feel like that's the, the same big reason that I went from doing HR in the trenches and yeah. decided to go out and do the, do the research, supporting other companies. I've, I've said, I wanted to have an impact on more than just the people under my responsibility, right? I want to help other HR leaders, other companies, but it's fun to hear you say it that way. So very neat. Very neat. So you and I, again, lots of fun conversations. I actually (laughs) wrote something down that you said the other day because I thought it would be a good way for us to to start this off. And we, I don't, I'll debate with you if I have to, but usually you and I kind of go along. (laughs) It doesn't have to be an echo chamber. It's all good. (laughs) You can be wrong. We can still be friends, Christopher. That's how it works. Maybe we'll see how it goes. So someone the other day was, was talking about what's, how the world's changing right now. And they said, well, here is the path forward, like the, in capital letters, the way for everybody to go. And again, you and I kicked that around a little bit, like there's not a single path, but I'd love to hear your take on, it doesn't have to be anything specific about what's next. It's really like a, a poke at the, the idea that there's a best practice for everyone. I'd love to hear yeah. your take on that. You know, so I think one of the things that's been interesting about my career is I've been in so many different industries, so many different functions, so many different areas that when you've been through all that, you do look around and there is this balancing act. And I think this is where you have to be really careful with it because, um, you know, there, there's one side of the spectrum, which is everything we do is so unique and we can't learn from anything. We, all, we have to reinvent the wheel. And I think that's, that's way off target. 
And then on the other side, you can have this, well, there's one where there's one path or there's one goal everybody should be charging towards. And, and that is that, right. And that's where you see the articles like top five skills. You should be focusing on that kind of stuff where you're like, okay, there's more nuance to things than follow this trend or follow this article. So I think it's, it's less of a, is there one thing we should all be focused on or is everything completely unique? It's more about taking the time to get to know what's really going on and deconstructing that down to what are you actually really trying to do? Because maybe ultimately in a perfect world, yes, we would all be marching to the same direction. Unfortunately, because of where every organization is from a maturity level, because of the cultures they have, because of you know, the different things they're dealing with, you can't focus on all of it at once. And so it's less about, oh, well, that's not important for us. It's like, well, maybe it is still important for you, but there are things that are more important for you. So maybe you need to start here. Maybe you should focus here first so that you can get to there. And I think that's really where the nuance comes in um, and where you, know, you have to walk that delicate line. You used the C word in there. You said culture. And I know that's mm -hmm. one of the things that's, you push back on the, the general sentiment that we need to fix our learning culture because again, I'm, I'm quoting you back at yourself. That might be a little surreal, but no, go for meta, it. Go for it. I've, I've heard you say you already have a learning culture, but you yes. might not like it. Will you talk about that a little bit? Cause it feels like whether it's a learning culture or just a culture broadly organizationally, yeah. we're thinking about like, we just need to snap our fingers and fix the culture or put this new culture in place. And you're like, Hey, by the way, there's already one there. Well, and I think that's, and it's that similar thing, right? It's similar to what I was just talking about, where it's like, you have the two sides. You have people that are like, oh, we don't have a culture. We need to make it. And you're like, well, no, you don't. It exists. But then on the other side, if you're like, well, we just have this culture and there's nothing we can do about it. This is just how we are. It's like, well, that's not true either, right? There, there is this continual evolution of the culture that you have. You just have to recognize it exists because that... I don't remember who says it, but that right culture eats strategy for breakfast. I mean, it's true. If this is the way your company operates, the way you think, the way your processes are set up to just march in and go, we're going to change it. Yeah. Good luck. Right. You're, you're going to get hit like a Mack truck. But if you say, all right, this is the culture we have. Let's work within the confines of that. But at the same time, let's recognize there are things we want to change about that, but let's be intentional about those changes. Well, at the same time, recognizing getting from point A to point B is a journey. It's not a, it's not, you know, a snap your fingers, like you said. So that's Drucker, right? Culture. Yes, strategy. yes, yes. There we go. It was either him or it was Abraham Lincoln. No, it was Peter that's, Drucker. <laughs> well, it was everything you read on the internet's tree. Said Abraham Lincoln. <laughs> we all know that, right? Yes. Yeah. Yes. Um, well, Drucker's the one I, I thought of because I used to have a, a picture of him in the slide I used with that quote, trying to yep. make the case that we need to focus on and use culture as a part of the strategy not as like two separate things a culture developing that and supporting that and caring about that should be part of your overall strategy and how you're approaching talent and, and learning so it's funny you one of the things you just said kind of got me i've had this idea floating around for a while i need to just write it out because it's been in the back of my head and usually when it stays there it's worth writing down <laughs> but you were talking about how there's there's a camp where like throw your hands up because we can't do anything there's a camp that that's like uh, you know we need to do something because there's nothing there. We're talking about the learning culture piece of that. And there's the, the truth is there's a third option. There's a third yep. channel somewhere. And I've been thinking about, we often do that where we're like, we have to make a decision between this really bad idea and this sort of bad idea. And we've just got to make a choice in this too. And often that's not the case. We force ourselves into that, that sort of option and yep. paint ourselves into a corner. But there's usually, if we stop and, and step back, look at it more critically, there's probably a third, fourth, fifth option if we want to really, really work at it, really think about those things. And so I'm thinking about writing something like the third option, like encouraging people to Ooh, stop making a That'd bad be a choice. That'd book title, by the way, the third option. Okay. I'll, I'm going to write that down. There you go. You write it down. You can, take, the thing, take the notes thing about talking. that though, no, and I think the thing you bring up that's, that's really good about this, and this is where I see that breakdown, right, is so often people are so focused in the activities of things, right, versus the what, what are we trying to get out of this and so that that ends up being a limiting factor because everybody just puts on the blinders and go well we have this and this is how things are working and this is how things versus saying okay forget all that what what really where do we want to be and what is it going to take to get there and then you can back into well you know this this component of things just isn't going to budge 
okay, fine. But then, then it's easier to find workarounds to say, but how do we still get where we want to go within the confines we have? I think sometimes we're just looking to make constant iterations to what we have instead of my term is like reimagine what it could be. One of the things that you and I discussed on a previous a webinar, something else we did together, was about the about the need to really focus not on the needs, not on this this silo. You said echo chamber a little bit ago. That's one of your favorite terms. I feel like I think it is. It comes up a lot. But not to look, you know, spend our time navel gazing, but instead go and spend time with the people in the business who actually have problems that we can help them solve. Right? It's it's not about us just thinking about those kinds of things that we're talking about here. We can get really in the weeds and 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 talk about all kinds of fun things that are learning and talent related, without ever once thinking about the people in the business that actually need to get their jobs done and how we're enabling that or not. We're thinking like you know here's what's here's our instructional design and here's our strategy for rolling this content out and like at the end well, of the day like or, or is well, it helping them? Think we will try, we'll try and do the human centric approach and be like, okay, let's pretend we're this audience member. And it's like, why don't you just go ask them? Like sometimes the simplest things are the things we just overlook. So we, and I'm guilty of it, right? There have been a number of projects in my career where we've sat in our crystal palace, imagining what people might need or the problems that they're solving. And we're like, see, we're so human centric because we're really putting them at the forefront. And it's like, well, did you ask them? Uh, well, we don't have time for that. Like, whoops, we didn't really get around. Whoa, to that. whoa, whoa! Now, hold up there. <laughs> Hang on. And I get it, right? We get we get caught up in things, and it's not always easy. But I feel like sometimes those simple tasks of why don't you just go ask them what they're doing or what are the biggest things? I mean, some of the biggest insights I've had and the biggest successes I've had is when I spend time. Is, you, you don't even have to like go out and do it. You just sit and talk with them. Just ask people, have conversations, and that's where you'll hear the things that you go. I actually think this is a bigger problem we could fix. There used to be a web comic. It is not there anymore, unfortunately, but it was so one of those, you, you read it and you're like, okay, I can see the person in my office that this is, this is actually talking about. And yeah. um, it was called one FTE. And one of my favorite ones ever, I have a screenshot of it somewhere saved was just what you're saying there. This manager, this person comes to their boss and says, Hey, I've done a generational and needs analysis and I figure out exactly what my team needs from me by looking at their, you know, their generations and, and trying to extrapolate the things they need. And their supervisor says, did you talk to them? There are three of them. Like you could just ask through them, but instead <laughs> you're going through all this trouble to avoid talking to them. You're doing a lot of busy work, but you're avoiding the actual thing that might lead to the best outcome. Right. Right. And I think sometimes it comes, it's a, it's again, just like everything we've talked about so far, it's a balancing act. Right. You can't just say, well, I went out and asked them and they said this is the problem. So that's what we're going to do. Because, hey, there are things that, you know, they don't always see. Right. They're, they're on the front lines. They may not understand the bigger picture. They may not be connecting things. But that's where you have to take that and then combine it with the other things and then say, OK, based on all this. Right. I think this. And you also also have to be OK with the fact that not all the eggs are going to hatch. Right. Like you're going to try things and it's going to be like, well, that didn't work. So let's try something else and not be so worried about the fact that, well, what if something fails? Great. Then we learn from it. We don't do it again. We figure out why it failed and we, we change it. Yes. Let's figure out on that small project before we go all in. <laughs> right. find before we invest hundreds of thousands of dollars or millions of dollars on something. And then we try it and we go, whoops, that was a big, that was a big mess up. Yeah. Like who's, who's on the chopping block for that one? What right. a genius. Right. So I want to shift gears just a little bit because I mentioned earlier you and I've, I plug this every opportunity because I love it. Um, Learning Tech Talks, it's a live stream. It's a live show that you run and you talk to different vendors in the learning technology community. Yep. And the question I want to ask you is how do you stay up on, on the vendors in the space and how can the average person who doesn't care about it as much as you do, but they're like, I just need to stay in touch. So if I have to go out looking for an authoring tool or trying to understand what the you know, the best learning experience platform is those people that want to understand just enough to be dangerous and, and be yep. the expert at their company. Any advice for them on how to stay up to date besides listening to the show, obviously? You know, so, well, and so I think there's a couple things. It depends on where, where you're at in, in the space, right? I mean, there are some resources where if you're just trying to be like, I don't even know what LMSs are out there, right? You can go to G2 or you can go to some of these web resources, e-learning industry, and just try and like look things up to see, okay, what's going on? Now, 
the danger with that is, right, that's just very surface level, right? So you might see, okay, here's the list and of all these different things, but it doesn't give you the context behind some of that stuff. So that, that's like your first line of defense, right? I just need some basic frontline stuff. Um, you know, I do look to the industry analysts like, like yourself, like Danny Johnson, um, you know, to kind of say, hey, what are you seeing? Because you're also doing research on this stuff as well, because that gives some broader context into what's coming, what types of things can we expect, what trends are we seeing kind of industry-wide. Um, you know, I spend a lot of time talking to people, right? Again, we talked about this with talking to employees. Um, there are lots of communities. I happen to host one too, where, where people join and it's just a place where you can ask questions. Hey, I'm, I'm trying to figure out, you know, we need a new authoring tool. What's everybody using? What are you happy with? What are you not? It's a very informal place where people can talk. So those exist where people can do it. The reason I took learning tech talks where I did was because, in many regards, all that stuff still doesn't get to the deeper conversation of one, let's dig deeper into this than we can. And two, a lot of times what happens is um, there's lots of noise in the space. And sometimes there are a lot of platforms that do do the same things. And so it's not necessarily a question of, well, do I pick A or B? It's more, well, what organization am I more aligned with or from a brand or future, the way they're thinking about things, how does that better align? And that only comes out with talking to the vendors. Yes. And a lot of people don't have time to, a lot of people don't have time to just sit on calls, which is why I created learning tech talks. I'm like, Let me do it. I do it anyway. I'll just make it available. So if you're really curious about, I heard about this tech, I've, I've done my fundamental research. I've read some kind of high level stuff, but now I want to get to know like, who are they? A is an organization. What what things should I be thinking about? That's where that's where it really comes into play. Awesome, I love that. That's one of the. That's one of the. I recommend people go to those kinds of forums anyway, just to get some insight from other people like them who are already using this. Yeah. Um, but it's also nice to get the perspective of that deeper look at what's happening, what's going on, right? From your your conversations when we publish research on whatever it is, you know, the, the compensation technology market or recruiting chatbots or whatever else, when we publish that research, it's from weeks, months, you know, tons of hours of, of demos and briefings and conversations. And we're going to distill it down into a certain amount of information that you can look at and figure out quickly what, what you're, what you're going to get out of that. So I love, I love that approach. And again, I, that's the reason I enjoy the show is because you're going beyond, okay, what is your, what does your technology do? Like, let's tell them about the real problems you're solving. Let's get at and try to understand. And through their conversation, you can usually pick up the cues on this is who we really are. This is who we serve. This is how or why we do what we do. And that's yeah. a lot. That's the fun stuff that that's never going to be in an RFP checklist. No, it's not. It's not going to be there. It's not going to be in, you know, the sales pitch when you talk to their, their frontline sales developer, business development rep, you're not going to get it from that. And I think the other thing, and this was, was part of the genesis of where it came from was, you know, my background is in tech. Like I love tech and I've been in this space. I've been in the trenches forever. There are just questions that a lot of people don't even know to ask, right? So they may look at things and they just don't even know. They hear artificial intelligence and they go, wow, it has AI. But did you know enough about the tech to ask, well, what are your machine algorithms actually doing? And how are you actually doing, using them to ensure there's no bias? And do you actually sit, right? Those are questions that most people be like, oh, I, I wouldn't have known to ask. And it's like, that's okay. You don't need to, but then use this as a resource to be able to dive into that. Be still my heart. You're talking about machine learning algorithms over there. Goodness <laughs> gracious. <Yeah. laughs> that's my love language, by the that. way, in case you didn't notice. Um, okay. Again, one last, one last thing I want to ask you about because I'm curious about this. And again, some people are hearing this. We've talked about around the idea of everybody's at a different level. Everybody's at a different, different business perspective, different business culture, different uh, maturity, their learning function. There's so many different variables there that when you go and you see that article, like here's the, here's the number one LMS for you. Mm, nah, I don't know about that. Or here's the three, the three things you've got to do to be successful in learning this year. Right. They might be light years ahead of you, or you might be at the front edge and you're like, yeah, I did that two years ago. So it's yeah. not like there's a one size fits all. So one of the things that you've been working on is this learning health check. And I'd love for you to explore that a little bit and talk about it because 
when you mentioned it to me the other day, it sounded really incredible. And I'd love to hear more about, you know, how you're forming that out what it does and how, how people can use yeah. that. So, and this is something that has been, you know, part of the, it's been building in my career since the beginning, because from the beginning, this was a space that I was very passionate about in helping people through because it is, I get it. It's confusing. A lot of people didn't get into learning in HR to learn tech. That, that wasn't why they got into it. And so they're in this kind of space. They're hearing all these things. To be honest, right now, the industry is extremely hard on us. Um, and, and in many regards for good reasons, um, but there's a lot of pressure on us to, to do it right. And I think that's left people in this very vulnerable, scared state where I think sometimes the reason we don't act is because we're afraid we're going to make the wrong move or, or we're afraid we're going to move in the wrong direction. And so that's not something you can get the right direction by filling out a survey form and getting a, a dashboard that shoots back to you that says, you know, answer these 20 questions and we'll email you a heat map that says, here's where you are because of the nuance behind that, right? There's so much nuance behind that, which if you don't have the skill set, and many organizations don't, right? Some big organizations, they may have somebody that has that super niche skill set that can just quickly glance at things and say, I see it. I think this is where you should work. I think this, but most don't. And I think that's where the health check came to be was to say, hey, my goal has always been to help organizations get from point A to point B, wherever that is. And I think that's one of the things that doesn't happen a lot. A lot of times there's a lot of, you know, you, you bring somebody in who says, you should be here. And it can be overwhelming. Like what? We have to, we have, to have AI and AR and, a, and an LXP running with, with personalization and adaptive learning. Like I, we, we're still sitting in the classroom. <laughs> and I think that's where that, that only comes with a personal touch, right? You, you can't machine learning that out of a process because you really need somebody who understands it to do it. And that's where, that's where that came to be was to help people say, hey, you're, you're not bad. You're not doing things wrong, but let's figure out what you're doing and let's make sure that you're taking the next steps in the right direction versus taking a guess or worse, not moving at all because you're just afraid you're going to take the wrong step. Well, that's one of the big themes that in the conversations that you and I have, we talk about that, that big picture lens of the world and, and taking that step back. Again, I've, I've said it already. It's easy to get caught up in, in the day-to-day -day stuff and not know what you don't know about the space. We talked about technology really deeply here and you've probably mentioned some terms that people are listening to this thinking, I'm not even sure I know what some of those things are that Christopher's <laughs> mentioning. There's nothing wrong with that. Right. Um, this is, that's your area of expertise and it's the stuff that, that you and I know and love. And yeah. with them though, it's like, Hey, I've just got to be really good at leading my team. Or I've got to be really good at delivering this thing or, or, or developing this content or someone who's an HR listening to this thinking, like, I've just got to figure out how to fit the learning stuff in with everything else that I'm doing and not screw yep. it up. So there's a, there's a wide range of those and everybody is in a unique place. So it's really easy to feel like when you hear, you know, here's the case study of the company that did it all right. And it's all yeah. perfect and everything it just worked out for them. It's like, wow, you know, how that, how that, you know, how that get there. The, the truth is those always hide the warts and the issues and the challenges and the things they went through to make that happen. And even still, when it looks great on the front end, there's still sometimes some things behind that, that are not great. They're not always right. perfect. And they're, have a, they're never perfect. There's always something no. that, that no. uh, even when you get it just right, someone, something changes and you've got to, you've got to figure out a new way to, to adapt and, and respond to that. Yeah, there's always, like you said, there's always the crash and burns. And honestly, anybody who says they didn't have any is just lying, right? It's like, they're, they're just lying. They, they, things blew up, things went south, things like that. But I think the other thing too, and this was, this was part of the reason, and I've been very outspoken about this anyway, some of these niche things like this, right? It doesn't make sense to invest the time and resources. So I was talking about this on a live stream today, right? The whole build buy, you know, what, what do we do? Do we hire, build, or buy it? And it's one of those things where it's like, sometimes there are things that it doesn't make sense to invest the resources and the time into building that internal capability because you might not need it for the long haul. And I think that's where, you know, that's that kind of decision process to say, hey, you don't, you don't need to grow and develop and have an entire organization dedicated to the future of learning and industry research because you as an organization couldn't keep up with the pace if you tried. So it doesn't make sense to build that because you'd invest all the time and resources and say, we aren't even achieving 
what we could. And you're like, well, then why would we have that as an internal resource? It just doesn't make sense. This has been so much fun. I'm, I'm enjoying this. And again, I'm making notes over here about other ideas or anything else you're giving me. Not only the, the uh, title for one of, one of my next books, but uh, also you had a really great quote at the very beginning that, that you dropped out there that I'm already have slotted in as the, it'll be the teaser for the episode because it's, oh, it's awesome. So this has been so much fun. Sometimes I struggle to find the right one for that one. So this one, you made it easy for me. So if someone loves some Christopher Lynn's, wants to follow you, connect with you, just learn more about what you're up to or, or you know, just be exposed to the world that, that uh, you're sharing, what's the best way for them to do that? So I'm a big, I'm a big LinkedIn user. Um, so when it comes to that, that is where, you know, that's where people can find me. Uh, you know, people can always email me on my, you know, Christopher at learning You can get a hold of me that way. But LinkedIn is really for good or for bad, right? It was one of the things that was interesting because as much stuff as I put out there, you know, you, you know who I am, you know what you're dealing with, you know what to expect. And, um, you know, that, that was something that I said, I've always been a big believer in transparency and authenticity. And it's like the Christopher you see on LinkedIn is the same Christopher my kids see when we're mowing the lawn. It's the same Christopher people in my community see when I'm out, you know, doing whatever else. Hey kids, let's talk about the learning experience platform <laughs> landscape. <laughs> I haven't dragged him into that conversation. Same person, yet. different topics. I'll say, right. we'll, no. we'll go with that. No, tenth birthday, Ben. Tenth birthday. That Once is they amazing. arrive, you yes. have someone coming up on tenth birthday. Ours, ours will be ten in about okay. two weeks. So okay. we're okay. coming up on that. We have got a few more months. Oh, gosh, goodness gracious. Okay, this has been a ton of fun, Christopher. All, all kidding aside. You've been tremendous. I appreciate your insights. I, again, respect your, your voice and your opinion of the world because you bring a lot of expertise to the table. And um, thank you so much for sharing with us today. Yeah, thanks for having me. Absolutely. To everybody else, thank you for joining us on We're Only Human. I'm Ben Eubanks, your host, and we'll catch you next time. Thank you so much for joining me on the show today. I'm honored to have you as a listener. If you enjoyed this episode, please take 10 seconds to rate it at iTunes, Stitcher, or wherever you listen to your podcast. Also, if you know a friend that could benefit from today's conversation, please pass it their way. After all, a rising tide lifts all ships. To see show notes, sponsor information, and our full show archives, visit OnlyHumanShow.com.